All right, let's get started. Hello and welcome everybody to our webinar today. Our topic today is progressive delivery across multiple clusters and cloud. This is presented jointly by WeFORKS as well as Linkerd. Jason, could you flip over next slide, please? We have a few housekeeping items up front. Um, please note this call is being recorded. All participants are in listen-only mode. We're more than happy to answer questions. Please use the Q&A panel and we will address those at the end of the presentations. Next slide, please. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. We have Jason Morgan, a developer evangelist here at Linkerd. And then we also have Paul Curtis, principal solutions architect here at WeForks. There's a quick bio on them. Um, you guys can read through that if you wish, and there's their contact information. We will share the slides um, after the presentation as well. So you will have that. All right, and then it's over to you, Jason, please. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna let uh, Paul go first just to give a talk about WeWorks. Okay. Sorry, next one, please. Yeah, no problem. So WeWorks is a company. Uh, we're a big contributor to the open source community, specifically in uh, Kubernetes. We contribute a lot of tooling. Uh, we are very much committers into the Kubernetes community. So that's a big portion of what our company is. Uh, we also provide consulting professional services, design, architecture, that type of service as well from the very people who wrote all those tools. So things like Flux and Flag are the tooling that you're gonna see today. Uh, actually those engineers work for Weaveworks. And the last thing that we do is we have a prepackaged upstream open source Kubernetes that we provide and use with our customers. And it is all GitOps enabled from start to finish. Next. So our big focus as a company is to enable. Um, we're not into long-term consulting. We would much rather come in, help you get started, show you the methodology, get ops and the tooling that we provide and get you set to go. The next one, please. And so before we begin, we have to talk a little bit about get ops in general. So as a methodology, these are the basic four principles of get ops. Basically, Kubernetes is a declarative system, meaning that you can declare very easily anything or any Kubernetes resource that runs in your cluster. And that ranges from our back all the way through networking, storage, things like that, as well as compute, namespaces, security, authorization, things like that. So if you put those declarations into Git, you get a lot of the benefits of source code control. So you get versioning and diffs and you get tracking and auditing. You can find out who made what change to everything. Okay. And so now when you go to GitOps, everything that you've declared in Git now becomes uh, picked up by agents that run inside your cluster and applied to the Kubernetes API. So that means that it's all done automatically. Right, so in what you're going to see today, which is kind of interesting, is Jason and I are going to interact with the uh, source code repositories. We're probably not going to do a whole lot at the command line because it's not necessary. The agents that run in the cluster are constantly reconciling what you've declared in Git to what is actually running in the cluster. So the two major tools that you're going to see today, uh, the first one is Flux. Flux basically is the tool that does declarative uh, sourcing into Kubernetes API calls. So that is that software agent. And so that means that you can have one Git repo and basically point five clusters to it and have those five clusters come up exactly the same way. But if you're doing some more advanced features, things like progressive delivery, we have a GitOps enabled tool to do that. And that one's called Flagger. And rather than you imperatively telling a tool to do the progressive delivery, you declare how you want it to be done. So in Flagger, you say, whenever there's a new deployment to this deployment, whenever it changes, 
I want you to progressively deliver with this criteria and these thresholds. And the thresholds are there in the flagger world to indicate what the success rate is or what success for the progressive delivery is. So for example, uh, we're gonna demonstrate a very simple web service. And the criteria for the web service to be successful is that there's no errors or a minimal number of errors. And the request rate or the time, the latency, doesn't go above a certain amount of time, X number of instances. So what that means is, is that you can automatically deploy a new thing and let this progressive delivery operator flagger, look at your declaration and then apply it to your application stack. The other benefit of it is, is that if any one of those thresholds is breached, i.e. there's an error or you run into problems, Flagger will automatically roll it back. So for an operator, this is the ultimate in fire and forget. You can do it on a Friday afternoon and go away and know that if, if it fails, it's not going to crash your systems. So that kind of give you a general idea of where Weaveworks is and the kind of tooling we're going to demonstrate. Now I'm going to go over to Jason and talk about Linkerd. Awesome, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so uh, a little bit about Linkerd. Uh, so Linkerd is a service mesh, right? It was it was the the project that started the term service mesh. Um, it is a, it is a very lightweight, very fast, and very security focused service mesh specifically made for Kubernetes. Uh, it's been in use in production for over four years. We've got a ton of folks on Slack, and we'd love to have y'all y'all come join us. Uh, we've got a lot of GitHub stars, but if you like the project and feel like popping over and, and giving a star, we always appreciate that. We've got lots of con contributors, and we're always looking to add new contributors. Uh, we run regular edge releases if you want to look at kind of what's new in the Linkerd world. Uh, and we're committed to open governance. So we're a CNCF project, um, and you can, you can get involved with us there. It's adopted by everything from very small companies to very large companies using it for a number of different, different use cases. So I want to step back here and talk about what is or what does Linkerd actually do for you, right? So a service mesh is essentially inserting a number of proxies in between your applications and Kubernetes. And it uses those proxies that give you some benefits, specifically benefits around observability. So better insight into what your application is doing, uh, easy access to metrics so that you understand, you know, is my application doing the right thing? Or in the case of something like Flagger, give you a standard way to look at and evaluate new releases of your applications so that you can consume that and, and deploy it in a programmatic way. Top of that, we give you uh, reliability benefits. We allow you to do retries when they're, when they're safe to do put in timeouts, and we give you some enhanced load balancing on top of what the native Kubernetes service does. But we do it without forcing you to learn a bunch of new, new objects or new custom resource definitions. Everything just becomes very native. Also benefits around security. So if you've got concerns around encrypting or identifying your workloads, you've got MTLS for that, and as well as, as, well as certificate management and rotation. And again, in general, every time we talk about Linkerd, we're thinking about how do we make it lighter, smaller, faster, and simpler. On that note, right, like who's it for? Linkerd is really for those platform owners, those site reliability engineers, those platform, platform architects, platform reliability engineers, allows them to provide, to provide enhanced services to their application developers, as well as their, those, those folks that are responsible for application availability gives you those tools, whether they're observability, reliability, or security tools, so that you can so you can create one, like a standard set of views into what your Kubernetes environment is doing. But you can do it in a way that allows your developers to, to get these benefits without having to write new code or interrupt their schedules, right? They can just take advantage of it by moving onto your platform. So it's there to solve technical problems, but it's there to solve them in a way that, that also helps you solve those social problems of how do I get developers to use this given thing? Or how do I answer, you know, when there's an issue? How do I how do I get past someone blaming DNS or the network or whatever it may be? And instead just show common data to everyone so you can quickly come to a resolution. 
Just the last thing I'm going to say here on design principles, right? Linkerd, uh, Linkerd is designed to be the simplest thing it can possibly be in that service mesh space, right? So what you're going to see is we install on the cluster. It just works. It's you don't have to you don't have to provide a bunch of con configuration to get uh, a secure mesh up and running in your environment. It's extremely light, right? It's written to be very lightweight in both the control plane and the data plane. The data plane being that that proxy environment. Uh, it's very simple and straightforward because complexity it makes it hard for you as a platform operator to, to, to deliver to your customers. And it also makes it hard for you to deliver that security. Speaking of which, uh, we just stay secure by default, right? You don't have to configure something to get MTLS. You don't have to configure something to get, get the benefits. It's just there in the Linkerd mesh as you get going. Uh, a little bit on the control plane. You can check us out on GitHub, Linkerd, Linkerd2 for the control plane written in Go. Very lightweight, very straightforward. Uh, we also have a data plane that is written in Rust. So we write a proxy. We don't use a general purpose proxy. We instead wrote a very specific micro proxy that's only for use within this service mesh. It's written in Rust, which is a, a very fast language. It compiles down to native code. And it, it sidesteps a lot of those memory vulnerabilities that you're used to seeing in C or C++. Uh, for that, if any of this is interesting, love to see you pop by on GitHub, raise issues, uh, contribute to it and or just start discussions on that discussions topic. We'd love to see you on Slack or if you're interested in Discord, we're also migrating to Discord at the moment or actually piloting it. And then we'd love to hear from you on Twitter. And that's all I've got before we move into the demo. Uh, Paul, do we want to stop for questions or just stream right in? Let's go right in. I don't see any questions in the Q&A or the chat, so please make sure you guys raise your hands or, or pop in so that we can stop and answer the questions. Um, so this first part is Jason. Uh, what, should I give them a little background, Jason, on what we're showing them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, so okay. what we're going to do here is we've got we've got two clusters, one one local cluster here on my machine just for showing off like a, a dev side of this cycle. Uh, it's going to be a, a K3S cluster, and I'm just showing you here on the right hand side. Uh, here's all the pods that are currently deployed. So, you know, I'm not I'm not hiding anything. Everything you're going to see is going to be going to be live. And then Paul's already got another cluster running in AWS. Is that correct? Right. That's already. Uh, interconnected with uh, with Weave Cloud. What is the difference between Linkerd and Istio? Uh, Alejandro, if you don't mind, we're gonna take that one at the end because it's kind of a bigger question. Um, but they're, they're both service meshes that just offer some different stuff. Yeah, so the tie between these two environments is Jason is doing his development on a local machine or a small cluster that they have and production is actually being managed at a larger scale and is running an EKS. So the connection between the two is how two things occur. One, how new applications or updates or releases are deployed. <clears throat> and we're going to use Flux and Flag or GitOps tooling to do that. And then when it's ready to go to production, how you can use very simple things in the source code repository Git in order to promote things from one to the other. So Jason's gonna take the first part, which is the dev part, and I'm gonna take the second part, which is the production part. So go ahead, Jason. All right, awesome. So first thing, because we've got a K3S cluster, we just wanna ensure that we can actually install Flux. So we're gonna run the Flux pre-check here. Uh, our, our prereqs all passed, great. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and do the actual install. Now, there are a couple different ways you can do this. I'm doing it in the more, more ephemeral way. And there's also a Flux Bootstrap command if you're planning on going to production with this. Um, so as I do my Flux install, we see a bunch of new stuff get created inside that Flux system. And our Flux installer is actually going to block our terminal until it's finished, until it's finished getting all its controllers ready. We've got the install finished now, which we can see here. So we're going to move on to the next step. Um, let's just take a look uh, at what we added to our cluster as we installed Flux. So we're going to take a look at the custom resource definitions that Flux creates. And custom resource definitions, if you're not familiar, are extensions to the Kubernetes API that allow you to hand off new jobs and automation tasks to Kubernetes. 
Uh, so we've got a couple different CRDs uh, or custom resource definitions, sorry about that. The ones that we're gonna be using today to actually do this demo, we're gonna be using this customization um, CRD, which actually allows us to take customized files, apply them into Kubernetes, as well as Git repositories, right? Because all, all of our code for this, both the runtime, that application or that common environment in Kubernetes, as well as our application are living in Git repos. Uh, so now that we've now that we've got Flux installed, let's just check to make sure that we can install Linkerd. Linkerd comes with a check command that allows you to validate your cluster both before and after doing an install. Uh, so we can see our our status checks are all good. So let's go ahead and install the Linkerd uh, Linkerd instance. Uh, so to get this started, the first thing I need to do is I need to give Flux and give this Kubernetes cluster access to the runtime repo. And so I've created this, this Git repository here as a YAML file on my system. And I'm just gonna hand it right off to the Kubernetes API because now that we have that CRD, we can just connect right to it. Uh, it the, the Git repo is called runtime and here's the URL that it's, it's hitting. If anyone likes y'all can pop over there and check out what, what we're installing in this environment. Now we're gonna go ahead and, and create it. We can see that a new, a new Git repository has been created. Here we can do kget git repository, right? And we've got we've got the the runtime. We can see what what revision it checked out, and now we can actually do do some more here. Uh, so what I've got is I've got this runtime that's been written as a as a YAML manifest, right? So it's it's three different customizations. So let's go ahead and and create it, and let's watch what's going on. So I've got three different customizations. Uh, now there's a little bit, a little bit going on here. So I've got, I've got three applications I need to install for my, my Kubernetes runtime. I'm going to install the Linkerd uh, control plane itself, right, which allows us to get the service mesh, the Linkerd Viz extension, which is in the in the two ten release of Linkerd, which just came out last week. Uh, we broke up the control plane into a couple different components just to keep it as small and lightweight as we possibly could. Uh, and then Linkerd Viz is what gives you Prometheus, which, what, which is what enables Flagger to do its checks. So let's take a look at that, at that file, right? And how we're actually getting it to do, you know, our sequential install of these components. Because Linkerd needs to be installed, then Viz, then Flagger. Uh, so if I look at the, the YAML manifest that I just applied, we've got, again, our new customization type. It's called Linkerd. Uh, this is where it's going to live in the Git repo and specifically in that runtime Git repo. And here under health checks, we list out every deployment that needs to be healthy for this customization to be complete, right? Which is, that's what allows, that's what allows Flux to wait or block the following or, you know, the follow on um, customizations based on its install. Uh, so with, with Linkerd out of the way, we're going to add Linkerd viz. It depends on that Linkerd customization, and then it has its own health checks. And then we have Flagger, the last one, uh, which again, Flagger depends on Linkerd viz. So we've got a chain of these, of these customizations that are getting applied. And we can see from down here that they're, they are occurring in order. So Linkerd is done. It's been installed. Linkerd viz is still checking on, on its health. And then Flagger will come after that. So understand that the the declarations of everything that Jason just said are in Git. Yeah. So that once Flux is installed, right, it will go through the Git repo that it points to and begin the installation of every declaration that's in there. Now, keep in mind that those declarations can be anything. So you're seeing, uh, in this case, a service mesh, but that could be CNIs, that could be CSIs, that could be, you know, any number of things that you put in, uh, authorization, RBAC, create namespaces, things like that. So it becomes a very powerful tool is you can then use Git and make the change in Git and have it reflected in the cluster that is pointing to that particular repository. Yeah, absolutely, Paul, thank you. Um, we ran a Linkerd check command just to see the health of our, of our service mesh now that it's installed. We see that, that all our status checks came back green uh, and we got a little bit on Linkerd viz, right? So, so as, you, as you add extensions into your Linkerd environment or into your service mesh, 
that Linkerd check command will will check on them as you do that that base health check for your environment. You can also do health checks by individual extension. All right, so among the things that got installed here, we added in Flagger. So let's just take a look at the custom resource definitions that come in with Flagger. We've got uh, alert providers, metrics templates, and canaries. I'm actually only gonna talk about canaries today, which is what we're gonna use for that progressive delivery. And again, folks, if you if you have a question, love to see it in the chat. I didn't mean to to bump you off, Alejandro. I just want to answer that with you know with full time when we get to it. Um, so we're we're going to create a new namespace for our application, uh, and then we're going to go ahead and and add all the things, including the Git repo for our app app into that namespace. So before you saw me create a Git repo, I just did a kubectl apply. Well, in this case, I'm going to use the, the Kubernetes or the Flux CLI to create my new Git repo. Uh, it is a private repo that exists here at, at www-demo. Um, I'm specifically targeting the dev branch, and you'll see why later as Paul uses the main branch to actually get an application installed in his uh, AWS cluster. And we give it a username and password, and again, target what namespace we want to send this to. So we can see, um, see down here, looking, we've got a new Git repository uh, apps, right? And it's already synced, so that was real fast. And let's go back to watching our customizations. So now we've got that done, we're gonna go ahead and, and deploy, uh, deploy pod info, right? Which is the application we're gonna be using for this environment. Uh, we go ahead and, and create the customization and we're gonna see a new one pop up and get and get deployed in the environment. And we can take a look at that pod info YAML, very similar to what you saw before, but again, this one's less complex. We don't have chaining. We're just gonna let it deploy immediately as it goes. And we see on the right-hand side, we've got pod info getting built in. You actually see a bunch of stuff happening with pod info. And that is because Flagger has taken a look at at what, what's happening. And it's seeing a canary instruction. It's actually gonna use that canary instruction to create a bunch of new objects. So let's go ahead and pop up the Linkerd dashboard and just see what we've got here. Uh, so we've got Linkerd, we've got Linkerd viz. Uh, you, can see, you can see the full Linkerd viz here on this, uh, on this octopus graph. So we see who's talking to what, including Flagger, which is now both being pulled by Prometheus and is pulling Prometheus for the information it needs to understand the environment. Uh, we can go back and we can look at we can look at apps. We've got our application that we just deployed. Got a couple components. We have a generator, a front end, which is just a simple uh, nginx instance, and then two deployments: pod info and pod info primary. Uh, pod info is actually the deployment that got created when I applied the manifest, and pod info primary is a new deployment that got created by, by Flagger to allow us to do progressive deployments. So let's, let's dig into the YAML a little bit. So we're just gonna take a look at, we're gonna take a look at that pod info folder. So this is what actually got applied. You see, there's a couple different files. We have generator and front end, which are new, new objects for the environment. We have the canary, which we're gonna take a bit of a deeper look at right now. And, uh, and then we have some some more stuff we need to make customized work correctly. So let's just let's just browse around at this environment, right? So now if I look, I've got um, I've, oops, sorry, KNS apps and that's just swapping over my namespace. We're going to look for deployments and see what we've got here. Um, so we've got our our generator, our front end, pod info, and pod info primary. Same things we saw in that in that Linkerd console. So now we're, gonna, we're just gonna keep that on watch because what's gonna happen here is we're gonna update the application. We're gonna see a bunch of interesting stuff happen there. If I look here, let's do... By the way, just as a note, the pods are actually running in pod info primary in that deployment. The other deployment has replica set to zero. So right. it exists, but there's no, no containers running at all. And so you'll watch what happens when you actually go ahead and do that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so before we do, before we do our, our install here, let's look at what this canary is, right? It's again, that custom object from flagger. Uh, it's there to monitor the pod info deployment. So that's what it's tracking on. We use a horizontal pod autoscaler uh, to allow it to, to scale up and scale down as needed. Um, the the kind of interesting stuff we've got now is, is under this analysis. So this is what tells, this is our rule set for Flagger, for the Flagger engine to know what should you do it and when, right? A um, couple properties that are, are worth looking at. The interval, which is how long its testing interval is. Uh, a threshold, which is just how many failures can we have before we decide this was a bad idea, we're going to roll back. We've got our, our step weight, right? That is how much traffic are we going to shift by every step? And then the max weight, which is how far do we need to go before we're satisfied and we can just say, yes, this was a success, move the rest of the traffic. So we're going to go in 5% traffic increments up to 50%. And if at 50, we haven't had more than five failures, we're going to shift everything over. So to get the to get the information that it needs, that Flagger needs to decide whether or not this is successful, it's actually going to be querying the Linkerd Prometheus and saying, "Hey, has my request success rate for that um, for that application stayed over ninety nine percent, right?" And on top of that, in that in that P ninety nine bucket for those responses, have we stayed under five hundred milliseconds, right? So fairly aggressive goals, um, and if we're happy with that, we're gonna we're gonna move on. So let's go ahead and change some stuff up real quick. Uh, I'm going to break out of this one. We're just going to watch now just pods inside this namespace. And we're going to, um, oops. We're going to go ahead and port forward our new application. All right. The other thing I want to show you uh, is we can look, we can look at, at the traffic split and see how traffic's actually going in this environment. So we can do linkerd viz, which is the command to that viz extension to look at the stats for the traffic split object that's been created by Flagger, right? And traffic split is, is what it sounds like, right? It is that we're gonna split traffic between multiple, multiple services, right? So we've got what's called an Apex service, right? Which is, which is a virtual service that references uh, some X number of other Kubernetes services to send data to. In this case, we're sending all of the traffic over to pod info primary. We can actually interrogate right through the Kubernetes API that traffic split object. Right, and get, get some information on it. We can look at the full YAML document, but that's kind of more than we want to see right now. So let's go ahead and check out this pod info app. Here we've got pod info. Um, so it's uh, you know it's nice. It's got this happy happy blue background, but I think maybe we're gonna we're gonna change that up. Uh, just before we do that, let's take a look at you know with Linkerd we've got we've got the ability to view namespaces, view the metrics on the namespace, as well as at any point right with this Linkerd viz dashboard installed, we can pop over here and actually look at the Grafana dashboard for any one of these objects that Linkerd is checking out. So we're going to pop open the, the Grafana for the, the app NS namespace. We can look at all the deployments, see what, what sort of request volume we're getting, what the latency is. We, we have the ability to view the statistics that you're seeing in that dashboard from a couple, a couple different angles. And you can, of course, connect this Prometheus to another Prometheus to store your data long term. We're going to go pop in and check out that front end deployment, because from that, we're going to see uh, some interesting stuff as we actually go do that that traffic change. Specifically, we're going to see, you know, as this thing kicked off, you know, it it started sending traffic to pod info, then the canary took over, created pod info primary, and we can see down here all the traffic now is being sent to pod info primary. None of it's being sent to pod info. So now we're looking at this, right? And and it's nice with that blue background, but you know, I'm picky about it. I'd really much rather this be green. So here we're on the git repo. That is, that is responsible for the pod info deployment. And we're gonna go ahead and, and make a change. 
So we've got this UI color right now. We've got uh, we've got green, and we're going to hop over to blue. And so with that change, right, blue is better. We're going to commit to our dev branch, and now we're going to see a bunch of stuff happen without me without me actually doing a, an awful lot, right? So we're going to just run another watch command. Going to run another watch command, and what we're going to see here is new pods get created as the Flux controller sees that that repo has been changed. So Flux controller is watching the Git repo for for that apps repo that we looked at, and then and then it initiates a new customization. And now Flagger, when it sees that deployment change, instead of just allowing it to all shift over, Flagger is instead going to force it through that canary process, right? So we see see down here the pod info deployment actually got told to go from zero replicas up to two with the new instruction set. So the new environment variable on that image file. Right now we've got, now we've got the pods ready and ready to handle traffic. We see that traffic split kick off and actually start sending from everything going to that, that primary service being moved over now 10%, soon to be 15% over to the canary. And now if we watch our application, what we're gonna see, um, were we green before or blue? I, I, I got mixed up. But what we're going to see here is that flipping between green and blue periodically as it, as it moves on. Uh, we can check this out inside the Linkerd dashboard itself. You know, again, anything I'm seeing in the CLI, I can see in the UI and vice versa. So I can check out, I can check out my traffic split object. Great. You know, I can see, you know, on the, on the pod info deployment that my latency is staying low and that my success rate is staying at 100%. So we're in good shape. We can also, if we wanted to peek in at pod info and see some of the live calls that are happening against that application, what are the return codes? So if we had something that was that was generating 500s or other errors as, as the application got rolled out, we'd be able to see it right here. What endpoint did you hit? What was the delay? What was the response code, right? And so we've got that live insight into the traffic. We also now have the ability to see inside our, our Grafana dashboard, where we're just gonna change our time uh, to refresh every five seconds, I've got that request rate has changed from being everything over to the one to now a fairly even split between them, right? And if I look at my app, I'm going to see now that that the shift is going to happen a little bit more often. Don't make me a liar, UI. There we go. Uh, so we've got that we've got that change going on. And again, I can see that from the UI. Now we're at that 50-50 split. So in this case, the whole time I've been talking. Right? I'm just kind of tap dancing because everything's happening without me having to do any amount of work. Right? So now that, now that Flagger has seen that the rollout was successful using those Linkerd metrics, it's able to so say, all right, we're good to go. So I'm going to scale up pod info primary. You see these brand new containers in pod info primary uh, get created and the old ones getting, getting terminated. It's going to scale them up with the new versions of that deployment. And then once that's done, it's actually going to take the old pod info pods and just turn them off and shift all the traffic back. In fact, we already see it. All the traffic's gone back to pod info primary. So a lot of action happened in the cluster and we got our full canary rollout uh, without me having to do a lot. So with that being said, right, we're gonna, we're gonna call this deployment a success. I'm gonna hop over to my Git repo and I'm going to, I'm gonna send a PR because I'm ready to go to prod. So yep, uh, blue is better. Absolutely, we're gonna create a pull request. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and, and stop sharing and send it over to Paul to take this into production. Okay. So um, while I'm bringing up my screen, what you saw there is actually comes up in two different ways, is that at no time did Jason have to talk to the cluster. So everything was initiated through Git. So one of the benefits of doing it that way is A, every developer knows how to do that, how to interact with Git, and B, it's very easy to set authorization policy for who can make changes, right? So the permissions that are built into the Git repositories actually make that very simple. So now we're into the production system. What you're looking at is the production systems Kubernetes UI. And we're gonna to talk to two things. I'm gonna to just touch on one thing. So in this 
uh, production cluster, we have Flagger and Linkerd all configured here. I'm not gonna go through them, but they're almost exactly the same as what Jason has in his development environment. So that's pretty straightforward. The second thing is, is that the Weave Kubernetes platform as a design pattern actually moves application stacks into what we call workspaces, which in essence are namespace scoped and secured uh, namespaces in Kubernetes. So we need to go find the one that Jason was working on, which is this one at the top called apps. So if I go in and look at this Git repo, I want you to note two things. One, I'm on the main branch and we can go in and say, ah, look, here's Jason's pull request. Okay, blue is better, says Jason. So the question is, let's take a look at what Jason, why he thinks this. And so this becomes an easy way to gate and promote application stacks between one environment and another. Now, Jason's environment is, you said K3D, K3S, running on his local machine. This environment is a production environment, which is running in EKS. The connection between the two is Git. So if you already have processes to promote software releases, this makes it very simple. So here we have, we'll take a look. I, I trust Jason. He said blue is better. So, you know, I, I really don't need to go in and look at his commit. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and just say, let's do it. So we put the merge in. Yep, blue is better, we're all good. And so we're gonna watch a couple of things. So Flagger is gonna do the exact same thing in production that it just did in development. In our cluster, our canary, in other words, the definition of how we want things to change is actually right here. Sorry, right here. So it is, we're using the same uh, criteria that Jason put in. So as you can see it here. So now as the canary gets to be building, we're gonna begin to see uh, the pods go up and down. So we have our containers here. And if I jump to Linkerd, I can begin to watch the traffic splits. Okay, and the problem was it already did it, but the same thing would be true here. I can actually see the request rates and the changes as the pods are rolled out and then rolled back. So as the canary is rolling out, Right. This is now automated. So you could actually insert any number of steps in here. Jason's pull request might not necessarily go directly to production. It might go to staging or testing so that it can be load tested. And then a pull request would go against a different branch. So the organization we used here, as you can see, is we did it via branches. This is one way to do this with GitOps. So here's Jason's branch, and here's the one that production is looking at. So question comes up is, can we have different strategies between dev and prod and how straightforward is it? Uh, yes, you can have different strategies. So you can have in your development environment, a much longer strategy that may have tighter requirements for passing the test or may have different load generator test uh, abilities. Yes, the way you do that is since the deployment is here, right? So what we're actually going to deploy is specified in Git. You can actually have different sets of parameters as well. All right, so here's the canary for me in main. I can do it on different branches. I could do it by different directories. Uh, there's many, many different ways to do it. Um, our customers tend to use the customization object in different environments and different directories to control what the canary strategy is. Okay, does that make sense? And, and oh, by the way, Flagger doesn't only do canaries. It does AB, it does blue green, it does a number of other ones. It'll actually do hot tests and things like that uh, in the same way. Other questions. 
how will a rollback work if something goes wrong? Well, that's a very good question. So if the deployment fails, if for whatever reason, the tests that are being monitored on these pods throw up to, let's say, too many errors or the latency goes too high, what happens is the traffic is reverted in the same manner that it was created. So in Jason's definition, he said, we're going to go up 5% of the traffic at a time to 50% over the space of a minute. Okay, now you can make the time longer, you can make the interval smaller. Okay, so things like that are how you control that. And so if it, if it one of the thresholds is broken, it just reverses that. So it'll begin to put 5% more traffic back to the original pods. Because if you watched uh, Jason's demo, what you saw is both sets of pods are running simultaneously. Flagger is using Linkerd to move the traffic back and forth between them, right? If it fails, it does the reverse. Okay, so what happens when you have multiple environments in play? Well, a canary is application dependent. So every deployment can have a different uh, canary. So if you look at this canary, just to give you an idea, at the very top, it tells you what is the target reference. When it flagger detects a change, and the way it does this is by listening to the Kubernetes API for events. When it sees a change in the pod info deployment is when it begins to look at what it has to do. So it becomes very simple to do that. Um, wow, okay, this is, so Andrew asked a very big question. Um, what GitOps patterns have you seen? And he mentions a bunch of different ones. So GitOps and Flux version two give you a lot of flexibility. So for any given instance of Flux version two, you can have multiple Git repositories with multiple directories and multiple branches. In fact, you can have the same Git repository, but only pick three directories out of five. Now, the nice thing about Flux and that toolkit is it in and of itself is declarative. So how you declare what Flux monitors is actually a declaration you would make in the same way that you would declare an application or a deployment. Or in this particular case, I'm showing you the de declaration for Canary. Now, if I modified this Canary right now, nothing would happen until the next deployment. So GitOps patterns, there's a hundred, and I'd love to sit and spend an hour going through them, but I've seen pretty much all of them. I've seen multiple directories, multiple branches, and a mix of all of the above. So multiple repositories as well. So if we go back and we take a look, we can see, I can't, I gotta switch back, don't I? Because I haven't seen enough time. So we can see where the deployment occurred and where the change happened. So in Linkerd, you can watch it live as Jason showed you. This would only uh, actually occur if there was a progressive delivery in motion. Now I'm gonna ask for Jason, tell me which one can I look at to see the overtime traffic? Yeah, you're actually fine. If you just hit the back button there, you'll see, you'll see front end. Um, if you scroll down a little bit to the outbound traffic. Oh, there it is. Right, right so, there. so there you've got, yeah, the results of that progressive delivery under request rate uh, in the center. Um, and uh, now you can see it a little better. Right. right. So you're seeing, um, what happened was, is that it ramped up traffic on one deployment here and ramped down traffic on another deployment. And then when it decided everything was okay, it basically turned all of the traffic on to the new one. If it had rolled back, the question was, what you would see is you would see it go backwards. It would reverse exactly what it just did. Um, two very good questions. So Alejandro, you ask, 
what are some of the metrics that you can use for success? Well, that's actually kind of a nice question because basically in here where they are defined, right, there's metrics. These are any Prometheus metrics. So what Flagger is doing is PromQL and it's looking, okay, and it pulls Prometheus on these two particular ones. So they could be application level metrics. So if your application, let's say, exported some internal metrics like uh, database connection time or query latency or those kinds of things that wouldn't be visible necessarily to Linkerd on the outside. If they're in the same Prometheus, you can actually go and get them. So you can use any metric you want. In WKP, in our world, the Prometheus that we install by default as part of the platform, we would typically make it all one. So the Linkerd and the service mesh metrics that are coming from Linkerd would either get put into this Prometheus along with all the application ones, okay, or the other way around. It, it doesn't matter. Flagger will look at any metrics that are available to it. And if you just to add on to that, Alejandro, if you actually go into the, the flagger repo and search for those definitions that you see there under the canary, you'll get you'll get how they're implemented by um, you know by whatever flagger is pulling for that, which is pretty neat. Right. And it is so if you if you read this particular metric um, just for fun, I'm gonna just highlight one. If you look at that, you could translate that into a prom qu uh, Prometheus query pretty much, right? Because that says the rate of request success rate, okay, must be greater than 99 with over one minute. So it, it it's a very, very specific translation. And you could probably do this. Someone who's familiar with PromQL would have no problem doing this. And oh, by the way, you can have as many of these as you need. Um, another question, if I deploy multiple components at once, okay, what you would want to do here is that's where you use what Jason demonstrated in Flux was the ability to do dependencies, right? So at deployment time, you can say, let's, you know, depending on what your upgrade policy is in the deployment, you know, it's like replace, recreate. Okay, do it over time. You can have those dependencies checked. So if the first one fails, the other two won't happen. So that's one of the biggest advantages in the new version of Flux uh, or the GitOps toolkit is that you can define those so that you don't have this like spray effect on all these different microservices that are interdependent getting deployed out of order. So Flux allows you to do that. The default is yeah, just fire and forget, go for it. Um, I'll ask Sonia that question. We'll save that one for the end. I assume the answer is yes, the recording will be available as well as Jason's repositories, as well as um, uh, the slides will be provided as well. So any other questions? Wait, there's one so over we here. We had one that I promised to, to defer to the end here. So Alejandro asked about, you know, the differences between, uh, between Linkerd and Istio. And so we, we hear that question a lot. So we've actually got it as part of our, our standard deck here. Uh, but essentially, it's, it really is, is a philosophical difference, right? So with, uh, and yeah, sure, I can, I can actually share the slide. So, you know, um, what, what we see is Istio's got like a ton of features and a ton of functionality. Um, it's, it's very well marketed and very, very popular, right? But uh, it, that, that feature set often comes with a lot of complexity, right? That makes for some folks it a bit hard to operate, right? Like last time I looked, you know, Istio had over 20, over 20 custom resource definitions. Linkerd has two and neither of them are required to get your app working, right? Like we take advantage of those, those native Kubernetes constructs. We stay really small, really determined to deliver just that uh, specific set of features. 
Um, and we make it we make it easy easy to get going and easy to get into production. So that's our that's our view on the difference between Linkerd and Istio. And of course, unlike the Istio project, you know, we specifically wrote our own proxy using Rust to get the lightest weight, most secure proxy we could we could imagine. And I'll add on to that uh, Flagger and the GitOps tooling for um, doing progressive delivery can use either one. It's actually independent of the service mesh that's underneath it. Yeah, it can work with your ingress. It can work with your application. Uh, it's yeah. got it's got a lot of different a lot of different ways to go. And then Alejandro asked uh, if Flagger is part of Flux or separate. It is a separate install. So if you yeah. look at the actual runtime repo we have here to actually deploy this environment, right? We had we had a couple different things, right? We had we had the Linkerd install, Linkerd viz, right, as a separate customized file, and then lastly. Uh, flagger, right? Separate from Flux, makes sense. I just put it in the Flux system because that's where all my all my applications went. Yeah, and I'll answer the other odd question: is <clears throat> the Flux project, which is a CNCF incubating project, includes Flagger? Okay, so the same group of people, uh, actually, the guys who wrote Flux originally for WeaveWorks. Um, it was written because we run a software as a service and we needed a way to do that. So Flux and Flagger are now part of the same CNCF project. So they're typically don't have to be installed together. Uh, Flux you install, we install everywhere. Flagger, if we need to do progressive deliveries of various different kinds. On that, uh, do we see any other questions? Oh, yes, we do. Wow, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna answer Artur's question. Controllers at the CDN level, that's a really good question. Um, not that I've seen, okay? I know that they are API driven I don't know that we have ever gone outside of the Kubernetes universe to do that. There are service meshes that will do virtual meshing between multiple clusters, but I haven't seen it at the CDN level. Um, I can take this one if you don't mind. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Engine, and I hope I said your name correctly, and I'm sorry if I didn't. Um, Engine asks, I found it strange that the mesh Mesh question has such an impact on the GitOps part. Uh, Argo rollout is on Istio, Flagger with Linkerd. What is your opinion on this? Uh, I, I think you may have, um, there, there may be a misconception here, right? So the Argo rollouts and Flux and, and Flagger's Canary are both independent of a given mesh or ingress controller, right? It's just, it's just what is their querying source, right? So if you're looking for an example of using Argo with, with Linkerd or Flux with Istio, you'll find both on their sites. Uh, and of course you can find both examples on the Linkerd and Istio mesh pages. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on to that is that the Flux and Flagger, the tools, the GitOps tools, we uh, at Weaveworks try to be agnostic to pretty much everything. And that includes not only the Kubernetes versions and distributions, but the things like the service messages. And if you look at that list, it covers pretty much everybody. Right, and actually writing one so that it will drive your particular networking solution is actually not all that hard. So uh, we have a couple of uh, other things. I'm just gonna share uh, some contact information on where to get things. Um, so for us, the Weaveworks one at the top for Jason and Linkerd. The version 2.1 came out when, Jason? Just this week, right? Uh, 2.10 came out last week, yeah. Love for folks to go go give it a shot. Yeah, please do. Um, we have a, the Weave community Slack that you see on here also has channels for Flux and Flagger, okay? And the CNCF Slack is where you should go if you have Flux, Flagger, or technical questions there. If you have general, hey, how do I get up something? Hit us on Slack there. 
Um, and that's it. Anything else? So uh, last question came through is, is it, does Flagger work with that? Uh, the answer is yes. And the list grows every day. So there's a lot of other tooling that's out there that uh, people have built for very specific things. And a lot of it is open source. In fact, most of it's open source. Okay. Um, that being said, I think we'll say bye. Thank you very much, Jason. That was excellent. That was a really cool demo. And please get in contact with us. And we'll be sending out the information with where to find the slides, where to find the Git repos, et cetera, uh, after the show. And does Sonia have anything else to add? I think that's it. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, that was really inspiring. And then we'll talk to you soon. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.